So we'll begin. And uh, I'm here in the IPA office in Lucan, County Dublin. So it's appropriate for me to welcome you in my native language, Kate Mila Falter Road. Translated means 100,000 welcomes. To this, our first IPA webinar, organized by the IPA team members, Despina, Mary T, Dorothy, Maria, Terry, and myself. It is wonderful that we have at this moment 121 participants uh, who have joined us from uh, Africa, Australia, Canada, England, Ireland, India, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Thailand, and the United States. We appreciate that it's very early for our USA participants, three or four o'clock in the morning, and very late for our Australian participants. But we greatly appreciate that you are all here. This webinar titled Empowered in Advocating for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Children is situated within the context of our IPA status at the United Nations and our first and fifth commitment from our seventh assembly of 2017. This year, we celebrate 20 years since IPA received economic and social council status at the UN, referred to as ECOSOC. The Economic and Social Council is the United Nations central body for reflection, debate, and innovative thinking on sustainable development. It serves as a central body of the UN for addressing global economic, social, and related issues. They are the body working on Sustainable Development Goals 2030. Uh, ECOSOC status gives IPA the right to participate in the United Nations by attending conferences and meetings, submitting written statements and reports, making oral interventions, and organizing both parallel and side events. The second context of today's webinar are the first and fifth commitments of the Seventh Assembly. The first commitment calls us to respond to the cry of earth and to people made poor by embracing the sustainable development goals in a human rights framework, addressing the issues of women and children, care the earth and indigenous people, as is relevant in our local regions. The fifth commitment calls us to develop a strategic plan for IPA. While initially I will be focusing on the fifth commitment, but both commitments are interconnected. Just over a year ago, the IPA directors, sisters Gabriel Morgan of Society, Joy Peterson from Conference, and Sharon Fagan from Union, and members of the IPA team, facilitated by the co-directors of Capital Horizons UK, charity, worked on responding to the fifth commitment to develop a draft IPA strategy. The draft was then shared with the IPA trustees, who are the IPA congregational and unit leaders, for their comments. And in February 2020 this year, I, the IPA Education and Action for Justice strategy was sent to all IPA trustees to share with their members and pres all presentation people. In April and May and later in July of this year, 24 IPA justice contacts who are the key constituents in our IPA structure and plan joined with the directors and team in a consultative and participatory process in drawing up an IPA implementation plan. Our IPA implementation plan is embedded in the IPA Education Action for Justice strategy. During these gatherings, there was another task we had to undertake to identify a specific IPA UN advocacy focus for the next few years. You may ask why a specific IPA advocacy focus? 
I will go back to when I was appointed this position. I spent some time in New York with Sister Elsa, our former IPA NGO representative there. I accompanied Elsa to all UN and NGO representatives meetings. And I came away from the experience greatly informed, but also greatly challenged. Particularly challenged by a comment made to me one day when I was within the UN headquarters, the comment being an organization or association without specific UN advocacy focus has no place at the United Nations. Having a specific advocacy focus for the IPA is critical for IPA. For its presence, its engagement and its collaboration at the UN, whether it is at the UN headquarters in New York or in the home of human rights in Geneva or Nairobi, the Office for Social Protection. It sharpens our emphasis at the UN and achieves greater impact on a global scale. It also strengthens our awareness about sustainable development goals and human rights framework across our IPA network. Thanks to the consultative <clears throat> and participatory online gatherings in the months of April, May and July online, IPA has a specific advocacy focus for the next two years, which is elimination of violence against women and children. As you are aware, violence against women and girls is one of the most widespread, persistent and devastating human rights violations in our world today and remains largely unreported due to silence, stigma and shame surrounding it. Emerging data shows that since the outbreak of COVID-19, reports of violence against women, particularly domestic violence, has sharpened, has sharpened increased in several countries as security, health and financial concerns heightened tensions accentuated by the confined living conditions of lockdown. The IPA project for the International Day of Eradication of Poverty 2020 is, as many as you are aware, the society's mission in Papua New Guinea. The focus of this project is toward the eradication of gender-based violence there. The statistics of PNG are alarming. 88% of the women rely on informal support networks for support. They have lack of access to government support structures. In an article prepared by the Justice Contacts Committee of Society for October 17th last, I quote, our work in PNG continues the proud tradition of Nana Nagel and the presentation people from across the world. This project will work to empower women and children and address systemic barriers which continue their oppression. When we scheduled this webinar, we scheduled it for the eve of the UN International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, November 25th, tomorrow. In the concept note you received in preparation for today's event, the speaker shared about this UN International Day, and she will share further it in her presentation. So I won't elaborate further on it. I take it now that you have noticed that members of the IPA team are wearing orange. Just to clarify, it is not our team color, but it does sharpen awareness that tomorrow, November 25th has been designed as the orange day. The color orange symbolizes a brighter future free of violence for the elimination of women against and women of violence against women and children. The color demonstrating solidarity in eliminating all forms of violence. Before I hand over to our IPA NGO representative, Dr. Despini Afariti Malaki, who has a dual role in today's webinar as a presenter but also our webinar moderator. I want to mention 
our IPA program action leader, Mary T. Kruger, who today is our video host. Mary T. is the person who will be assisting us, the team, with our slides, our videos, and will later allocate us to our breakout rooms. I mentioned to her yesterday, you know, the confidence I have in Mary T. makes, it, make, makes our job so much easier. There are a variety of talents in our team, and I thank God for that. So just a few practical matters. The webinar is being recorded and the recording, but it won't be recorded during the breakout sessions. It's being recorded to facilitate those IPA members and presentation people who are unable to join us because of the unfriendly time zones at this time of the year. We will also be taking a, a screenshot of the participants but we'll let, we'll let you know when that's happening, the way they're looking up. But also, if you prefer not to have your photo taken, please knock off your, your video at that time. I think Mary T will be muting or has muted our microphones because it, it helps not have an interference during the presentations. But of course, she will unmute us later, later on. And I know Anna Lee has sent me a, a, a note in the, in the chat that she was having difficulty coming in. So she is here all in audio. She has knocked off her video. It helps if you haven't got good internet connection. So welcome to all. This is a very special day for all of us. And I'm now going to hand over to the Spina. Thank you all. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. Um, just give me a minute, uh, I will share my screen with you. Can you see? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So um, this uh, webinar is about um, uh, identifying um, uh, ways to further advocate for, for the elimination of violence against women and children. Uh, during my presentation today, I will um, share with you some ideas, some recommendations uh, on what you can do in the local level, on local level to strategically and more efficiently um, advocate for ending violence against women and children. As Anne-Marie mentioned earlier, tomorrow we commemorate the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. The 16 days of activism against gender-based violence also commences uh, tomorrow and ends on December 10th, uh, the Human Rights Day. This year, the campaign will take place under the global theme, Orange the World, uh, Fund, uh, Respond, Prevent and Collect. Um, I will further um, mention some details about tomorrow's uh, commemoration, but that would be at the end of my presentation. Um, we are all aware that uh, women and children experience uh, violence in a variety of contexts and in diverse spheres. Uh, there are many forms of violence against women and children, including sexual, uh, physical or emotional abuse by, by a family member, by an intimate partner, uh, or even by authority figures, uh, trafficking for forced labor or sex and um, traditional practices such as forced or, or child marriages are some forms of, of violence against women. And um, a gender-based in inequality and discrimination, uh, social norms and gender stereotypes are the root causes of violence against women and children. I have plenty of statistics here, but uh, since we are uh, pressed for time, uh, I won't be able to analyze them. Uh, my presentation will be available to you after the webinar, so you will have the opportunity to view the data then at your own convenience. Uh, there are a number. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. There are a number of uh, global uh, agreements developed by the UN to address the issue of violence against women and children. Um, these are some examples. Uh, uh, my suggestion would be to start by finding out uh, which international uh, conventions or, or agreements uh, regarding violence against women and children your country has ratified 
and advocate for ratification or implementation of these agreements, or even for removal of the reservations that your country might have expressed for, for any of these global treaties. Um, the SDGs, as Anne-Marie mentioned earlier, um, uh, together with the other uh, international agreements and treaties, create a human rights foundation uh, to help countries achieve gender equality and uh, end uh, all uh, forms of gender discrimination. The SDG 5, uh, achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, uh, directly addresses the issue of violence against women and girls, uh, including trafficking, child marriage, um, sexual and other types of exploitation. Of course, achieving gender equality requires going beyond SDG 5 and uh, its, its specific gender related targets. All uh, 17 uh, SDGs are relevant for, um, uh, for making gender equality um, and the empowerment of the women and girls uh, 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 the reality in all countries. After all, the, the promise uh, to leave no one behind uh, cannot be fulfilled uh, without um, putting an end to violence against women and children. Despite certain achievements and progress, a full gender equality remains unreached. Um, let's identify now some ways uh, to eliminate violence against women and children. There are many different ways uh, to end violence and uh, each of them is as important as the others. Uh, here though, we examine three priority areas, uh, prevent, respond and advocate. Prevention, primary prevention, if I may say, uh, aims to stop violence against women and children from happening before it starts. Um, primary prevention is the most effective, yet the most difficult way uh, to end violence because uh, it, it aims to challenge and change the, the, the attitudes and, and the behaviors and behaviors that allow violence to occur. These are some examples of prevention. At this point, uh, I would like to, to emphasize the importance of engaging men and boys in every step uh, while working to end violence against women and children. Um, sometimes when we hear uh, words like uh, gender equality, most people immediately assume that these are women's or girls' issues. Um, since girls and women suffer more intense forms of discrimination uh, than boys and men, uh, taking a gender perspective often does require focusing on, on achieving girls and women's um, protection of their rights. However, achieving uh, equality uh, for girls and women is not possible if boys and men are left out of, of the equation. Uh, without male allies, um, change will come more slowly. Moreover, men and boys are also affected by gender discrimination. Popular ideas like um, what it means to be a man uh, can make young boys take part in, uh, in uh, risk-taking behavior, including uh, street violence, uh, drug abuse, um, or even unsafe sexual practices. Uh, so I guess gender equality benefits everyone. One uh, of the most important ways to address violence against women and children is by increasing the access of women and children survivors to quality services. Uh, here are some examples of such services. And um, let's go on to the next one. In order to end violence uh, against women and children in the long term, it is essential to advocate for policy development and legislative change. Here are also some examples of advocacy activities that you might undertake. Uh, there, are, there are many ways of describing and conducting advocacy uh, for the purpose of this uh, webinar. Uh, one simple uh, overarching definition could be that advocacy is the deliberate per process uh, based on demonstrated evidence to directly and indirectly influence decision makers, stakeholders and relevant audiences to support and implement actions that eliminate violence against women and children. Evidence is very important because it, it provides legitimacy to advocacy. If your evidence is credible, then the decision makers will take your, what you have to say uh, seriously. Um, advocacy represents a set of strategic actions that uh, will influence uh, the, the decisions and uh, policies of others. Um, and now it is time to, 
to get started on how you can organize your advocacy work, how do we begin? Uh, answering this question involves uh, setting advocacy goals, outcomes and activities, which would help you to move from advocacy planning uh, to action. Uh, the advocacy goal is our long-term uh, is our long-term vision. For us, it is the elimination of violence against women and children. The ultimate impact of, uh, of our advocacy to eliminate violence should be to bring, um, to bring about positive and, uh, and lasting changes in the lives of all women and children so that their position um, uh, is strengthened in, in the society. Uh, advocacy outcomes are short-term results that must be achieved in order to reach um, the, the advocacy goal. And advocacy strategies you usually have multiple outcomes that are achieved on, on the way to that goal. Um, for ad advocacy to be effective, uh, it is important to plan it right. Um, a good advocacy plan should reflect where, where you are, uh, where you want to go, and how you can get there. And here is, the list, uh, here is a list of questions that every advocate must ask when developing an advocacy strategy. Um, advocacy, um, we all need to know that it's not a linear process, it is a cycle. Uh, while you don't have to go through these questions in a strict order, you will need to constantly revisit them as you plan and implement your advocacy strategy. Uh, unfortunately, time does not allow me to further elaborate on each and every one of these questions. As you can see, there are several more pertinent questions. I, just, I have just chosen to present here uh, those specific ones that I thought might be of re relevance to your everyday work, but I will give you some general uh, guidance on them and ple ple please feel free uh, to contact me whenever you like. I would be glad to talk with you and uh, analyze them further and clarify any question that you might, that you might have. Let's talk uh, a little bit about question one. Uh, what do we want? Um, uh, we need to remember that uh, selecting uh, our advocacy issue does not mean focusing only on, on the broad theme uh, you want to address, that is ending violence against uh, women and children. Uh, you also need to think about specific problems linked to this broad issue, uh, some barriers to solving them, and their policy-related solutions. Uh, this can be done effectively using the tree image, the graph that we, we have sent you. Uh, it is a tool called the problem tree. This is very useful, a very useful tool for conducting a, a deeper uh, situation analysis uh, because it, it offers a, a visual structure to, to analyze the problem and its solutions. Uh, the tree you received is the problem tree. It helps in understanding um, the immediate uh, un or underlying and uh, root causes of, uh, of the issue, as well as helping in gathering information to support the analysis. Now, um, during the breakout sessions later, uh, the exercise will be to turn the problem tree into a solutions tree. Uh, one way to identify solutions is to reverse uh, the risk factors, uh, the causes and consequences of, of the main problem. Uh, on your local context. Um, the solutions tree uh, will help you to identify possible areas where you could advocate for change. Uh, it would be ideal to advocate for all the issues identified uh, through the problem and solutions tree analysis, but um, your advocacy should prioritize one issue at a time uh, in order to ensure focus and success. Um, and. Uh, Remember that the advocacy priority you start with uh, can, uh, can build the momentum for the next cho chosen issue. And for the next one. Okay, uh, who can give it to us? Uh, answering this question involves identifying stakeholders and power to determine key targets and partners for uh, advocacy. To begin uh, by uh, we can start by, by taking note of all the people who are involved in, influence, or care about the issue. These are your stakeholders. They might be individuals, uh, groups, uh, or institutions. 
And here are some questions um, uh, to ask in order to determine stakeholders for your advocacy. And uh, here are some examples of um, organizations or um, individuals you might consider working in, uh, in partnership with. Um, let's go to question three, what do they need to hear? Um, answering this question involves developing evidence-based messages for each specific target. Uh, a message simply means telling your story. To do this, you need to think about what you want to say and how you should say it. Uh, to begin, you need to develop one clear primary message, if I may say, uh, which clearly summarizes your position and the changes you want to bring about. One way to develop a primary message is to think of a statement uh, representing the main idea of your message, then the evidence to support the statement, as we previously mentioned, and um, finally the action desired from the target audience. My tip to you is uh, to keep the message uh, clear uh, and brief, to use powerful words, uh, very precise and clear facts, and to encourage the, the, the audience to take action. Uh, in other words, present a possible solution for them. Um, you need also to find out uh, who will be most effective messenger for your advocacy. Um, effective advocacy uh, delivers the right message to the right audience by the right messenger at the right time. Uh, the messenger matters uh, just uh, as much as the message. Uh, consider who will be most credible source in the eyes of the target audience. Um, sometimes policy skills are important, but other times uh, first-hand um, knowledge uh, of the problem, uh, maybe technical expertise, uh, popularity or seniority in uh, within an organization, you know, our organization matter more. Uh, also, it, it can be effective to have two messengers who complement each other. Um, here are a few ideas of for advocacy messengers. And um, I think now it, it is time to start getting more specific uh, about the kinds of activities that you could use to move your advocacy forward. Uh, answering this question involves uh, selecting the most effective way of delivering your message. And this may include one or more of, of these uh, uh, ways of the following ways here. Uh, public campaigning, uh, as you all know, is the process of engaging the public and getting them to take some action to demonstrate their support for your advocacy. Uh, public campaigns can help you raise awareness and grow the number of supporters. Uh, in this way, it can put pressure on, on, on the decision makers uh, to meet their, uh, the, the obligations made by their governments. Uh, as you see, there are many ways of, of running a public campaign. Many campaigns today use a mix of both offline and online ways uh, to advocate. Um, media can be a tool, but also a, a, a target for advocacy. Uh, therefore, the specific role of the media in achieving your advocacy goal should be um, clearly integrated into your, your advocacy strategy. In engaging with the media, there are several tools, as you can see. Um, which tool you use will depend partly on the strength of your story uh, or even the content of your story and the resources you have available. Lobbying, effectively um, delivering your advocacy message, uh, especially in the policy arena, uh, generally involves lobbying and uh, negotiating. Um, lobbying is about informing and convincing decision makers to support and advance um, your agenda, the ending of violence agenda, uh, by directly communicating and uh, building relationships with them. Uh, the, the primary targets of, uh, of, law, of the process of lobbying uh, are the people with the power to influence uh, a, a policy change uh, relevant uh, to the elimination of violence. And uh, lobbying can occur either formally or informally. Um, yes, before concluding my, my presentation, I'm also sharing with you four examples of uh, uh, UN global campaigns that you can link your own advocacy campaign to. 
Um, the first one is the Unite campaign. And um, this campaign has uh, proclaimed the uh, day 25th of each month as the Orange Day. And it also um, unites um, the campaign with the 16 days of activism, as I said earlier, starts tomorrow. And um, also this, the shadow pandemic, uh, I'm pressing of time, I'm pressed of time, a he for she movement and planet 5050 step up uh, for gender equality. Uh, link these campaigns to specific occasions you can link them to international celebrations like International Women's Day or um, tomorrow International Day for the Elimination of Violence or International Youth Day and, and so on. Um, I know uh, I, I, I'm very well aware that my presentation contains an abundance of information uh, that definitely uh, requires plenty of time to be processed. Um, as I have mentioned al already, my presentation along with all the other material and videos of the webinar will be sent to you uh, directly after the conclusion of the webinar. Please do not hesitate to contact me uh, with whatever question you might have or any discussion you might wish to have with me uh, on any of these matters. Um, I would be glad to talk to you. I know, I'm sure that together we can make a difference. Together we must act. Um, we used to say here at the UN, think globally, but act locally. So I want to share that with you. And uh, without being said, uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, let me stop sharing now. Okay, and uh, now uh, please take a moment to relax until Meriti uh, arranges uh, the, the groups for our conversation, the breakout sessions. Before going into groups, Meriti, um, let me uh, share um, the question uh, that would be oops, sorry. that would be our focus for uh, the breakout uh, discussion. Okay. Okay. Here's our question. Um, I don't know if I can. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Uh, I don't know. My, my screen just. Course. And, and um, so um, uh, this is the question that we will focus our, um, our discussion in the breakout sessions. Um, I wish I could uh, put it in the whole screen, but I, I don't know what happened with my computer. Anyway, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, during the breakout sessions, we will try and turn um, the problem tree into a solutions tree. Uh, we will reverse the risk factors into protective factors, the factors that uh, you think uh, that will decrease the likelihood of the problem occurring. And uh, we will do that in order to uh, identify solutions. Mm. Let me give you an example, just if I could be of some help. If the risk factor uh, or cause you pointed out uh, is, um, for example, inadequate laws uh, around um, I don't know, sexual harassment of women in public spaces, um, then a possible solution will be developing a law to, to criminalize sexual harassment of women in public spaces. Or maybe other solutions could be ensuring strong law enforcement or better and safer public in infrastructure or, or even working with men and boys as partners in gender equality, as we mentioned before. Uh, this solu solution three, oh, okay, now we <laughs> got uh, the solutions tree will help you to identify possible areas where you could advocate for change. Um, Merti, are you on? Um, can we? Yeah, I, we are on. Um, so everyone will be put in their breakout rooms. Um, we'll have 25 minutes. And remember, we're asking the justice contacts to kind of lead the conversations. Um, and make sure you do introductions so people know who you are. Hopefully, you'll, you'll meet a few new presentation people today. So 
I um, enjoyed the conversations. And if you have any questions, there's a help button on the bottom and I can come in if you're having Zoom issues. So just let me know. Enjoy. Yeah. Did people meet new people? Yes. Yeah, I was so happy. Good. We had the Zimba <laughs> Zambia, Zimbabwe novices with us. I was so happy. Oh, wow. nice. Nice, Anne Mary. Thank you. Thank you for engaging in <laughs> breakout sessions. Okay, I'm sure that the discussion uh, in the breakout rooms was uh, as much inspiring and er energizing as it was in my group. Uh, unfortunately, time is pressuring us and uh, uh, I would have to ask uh, one volunteer from uh, only one, uh, from only three groups uh, to step up and share with us um, a brief statement that came out from your conversation. Um, Mariti, can you see the... Someone, if someone is raising his or her hand. I think we had um, Anatolia, Gemma, and Brian volunteered to share. Oh, thank you. Thank They're you voluntold. so much. I'm not sure. One of those two, but they, they volunteered enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for volunteering. Anatolia, can you share with us your thoughts and your statement um, that came out from, from your group? Um, actually, it looks like she got bounced off the call, so we might. Gemma, can you go, go to Gemma? Next? <laughs> yes, we can. Absolutely. Um, I've, I've framed our comments just around two particular areas. Um, the first area was around education, and then the second area was around the importance of um, assistance being made aware. So I'll just talk about education briefly. Um, we first preface our conversation by saying that this is a long journey that we share in our respective contexts. So advocacy is something that we need to continue to work out and continue to maintain that momentum. So a lot of these things are, are works that we'll need to continue for some time. We um, had a, a, a varying combination of people that have all had some hand in education. So that was really beautiful to see. And one of the things that really came up as important was really understanding what abuse looks like and, and being able to be aware of the warning signs. And then once you are aware, what do we do with that information? So I think that was a key part. And in terms of solutions, we looked at how might we actually educate both parents, children, um, professional services, members of the church, etc., people who, with whom we have a reach um, in our local areas, because that would look different for all of us. So we, we spoke about that. We also looked at if there were people in our areas who were doing that particularly well, that we might actually partner with them to form that um, education opportunity. We also talk about the importance of removing some of that stigma and fear of people feeling open to sharing stories um, and people, you know, raising awareness through hearing um, anecdotes and then understanding how people may have come to a, a different reality on the other side of what they've been through. So I think that constant invitation um, and also for us um, not being afraid to, to hear that story because of what might come as a response. I think that's something that's a real nano call to action. And we also spoke about the impact that things like, you know, writing letters and lobbying can have when done, you know, en masse, that can be a really effective way to, to educate some of our politicians on the importance of this issue. Mm -hmm. And then from a school perspective, we talked about the importance of it being embedded in a curriculum. So not just in, say, a religious education context, but also across all curriculum areas in an age appropriate manner. Um, and that was something that really um, everyone felt quite strongly about. And also in a, a knowledge sense, but the importance of soft skills about how do we teach our young people to respect each other? Um, how do we teach people to, um, you know, children in schools to be treated with dignity? So those those soft skills in a, in a 21st century world, I guess. Yeah. And then the other thing we talked about um, was just about, particularly during COVID-19, um, there's been a, a little bit of an increase in organisations getting their message out there that they are available to assist um, people that are experiencing abuse, but that visibility needs to be a consistent thing and people need to be made aware of the services and the organisations and perhaps as part of our call to action to, to connect the dots for some people. Um, because where that awareness exists, then you know that assistance can help. So hopefully, as a result of the pandemic, that will continue going forward. Thank you, thank you, Gemma. Thank you. So useful comments. Um, Anatolia, are you back? Can we hear from you? Yeah. 
Is Anatolia there? We can go. Yes, I am. Right? Oh, okay. Yes, yes, Anatolia, please. Yes. So we were in group 10 and um, our sharing, we, we discussed that there is silence in the issue of violence against women and children. And in most cases, this, this is due to cultural beliefs and experiences. And also during this time of COVID-19, we were wondering what is really happening to the people, to the women and children. And um, in some parts of the world, the media is trying to speak out for women and children. And also we, as a group, we said there's a need to break the silence, especially to those who are involved in education, that um, women and girls should be educated and awareness should be brought to them to empower them. And also educators should not leave it all to social workers as educators also have a role to play in bringing awareness. But we as a group also said there is need to balance. Let's balance when we, while we are empowering girls in schools, let's not, for, let's not forget or disempower the boys. Let's move with them together. And also to, dis, to demystify that um, boys are superior than girls or men are superior than women. You're right. Yeah, drink. you're right, Antolia. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we are uh, we are pressuring. We are pressed with time. I'm sorry. I have to skip. I know I said three persons, but now we have to uh, to just stay with the two uh, statements. Um, thank you, everyone, for being so actively engaged in in this exercise. Hopefully, it was. Um, as informative and enlightening as it was for us. And now without further ado, uh, it is time to share with you a very touching story, a human voice from a young woman who has experienced extreme trauma, violence, abuse and pain in her life. But thank God she got out of it stronger and empowered to inspire others, to inspire all of us actually. Uh, I'm happy to let you know that we have Meredith with us here today She's also attending the webinar, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, for us, this is a unique privilege. We really appreciate that, you know, Meredith, we have you here. And uh, she, she has prepared a video for us. Meredith, would you please help us view Meredith's video? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you members of the IPA for taking a profound interest in the issues surrounding domestic violence. My name is Meredith and I am currently domestic violence surviving. My story has all the classic elements of a typical domestic violence scenario. The red flags were present during the dating stages. Our disagreements became a war of words. I was always left defeated and made to feel ignorant. He had my friends and family on speed dial calling them often to convince me to stay in the relationship, citing nobody could, did, or would love me the way he did. So after we got married, he manipulated my personal bank accounts. I became cash poor, therefore financially dependent on him. I was humiliated and exploited sexually, and over a period of time, I was hit, chased after, thrown into furniture. I was left with permanent scars, I also lost the feeling in my left hand due to one night of him restraining me. I covered my bruises with makeup and in the hot summer months, I wore long sleeves. My brain was numb, tired, and scrambled. Once I realized his knee-jerk reactions could no longer be predicted, I reached out to those closest to him, hoping they would guide him into a healthy frame of mind. I indicated I was badly hurt and that next time I feared a hospital visit or I'd call the police. The message was relayed to him, but instead of him changing his behavior, he considered it a warning. 
So one night during one of his rages, while he was geared up to hit me, I backhanded his chest for him to get away. Instead, that warning that I gave him inadvertently led him to call the police first. But before the police arrived, he told me the officers would never believe my story and that our child would be taken into foster care. I was scared, afraid to talk, and so silently I was arrested for domestic violence. But I believed I'd be given a safe place to state my history and my fears, but that didn't happen. I was sentenced to 48 hours of community service, one year probation, time served, and I was forced to take a domestic violence offenders class. My court appointed psychiatrist indicated that I was a victim of domestic violence and quote, extreme mental cruelty. And while you think this would be enough to leave, there was still more. I wanted to keep my family together, but it all came to a head when I ended up in the emergency room. The doctor told me he wasn't willing to release me back to my abuser. He had a genuine fear for my safety. That was May of 2017. I left my abusive relationship two months later and I never looked back. Through proper healing via therapy and the help of family and friends, I have moved on slowly, though I have extreme PTSD. Through that all, I've traveled to Guyana, met the president of the country while serving as a spokesperson for domestic violence. I am a founding member of Four Year Record, a group of women who provide financial resources through donation, legal counsel, escape plans, and therapy. Also through my domestic work, I have met professors, attorneys, young women, old women, rich and poor, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, because domestic violence does not discriminate. So in order to combat the problem, we need to first make an uncomfortable conversation comfortable. We cannot begin to be of service to victims if we do not provide places of refuge, glimmers of hope, and jurisdictions that support a domestic survivor's plight. Again, thank you so much for your time. Wow. Um, I have seen this video twice before, but uh, every time I watch it, it is, it is so touching and powerful at the same time. Um, it generates su such strong feelings that I can't seem to, to find words to express what I'm feeling right now. Uh, I'm sure everyone here shares the same or at least similar feelings uh, that actually leave us speechless. Um, Meredith, would you like to add anything further? Just one statement from you? Is she here? I'm here. Hi there. Hi. Hi, Hi everyone. I just want to thank you again for the invitation. I'm so touched that you've included me and that you want to keep the conversation alive. Uh, but more important that we're that we are having the conversation. And like I said in the video, it's an uncomfortable conversation. So we need to make it comfortable. And we need to get rid of that shame. Um, stigma and the taboo subject of, of violence against women. And um, that's, that's part of the advocacy work is getting to know who we're advocating for. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, I only have to say one thing uh, to you. Uh, you are the real hero and stay strong. Um, keeping that in mind, uh, it is my distinct privilege to introduce to you the members of the IPA Spirituality and Charism Committee. Uh, with their process today, they will help us to spiritually embrace the issue of violence against women and children with love in our hearts and to be engaged in the energy of the whole making. Uh, Maria, Dorothy and Terry, the microphone is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's just hold Meredith's story and many stories of many women whom we know. And let's just breathe together, slowly and deeply. In the name of the Spirit, breathing in all things. And Jesus said to her, Woman, you are made whole. You are set free. In this spirit, 
our theme for this reflection is love, moving energy of whole making. Whole making rooted in love is intrinsic to why we do what we do to our IPA mission and advocacy focus now. We believe the major issue facing our world today <clears throat> is not political, economic, social, cultural, or religious. It is spiritual. It is a crisis of memory. We have forgotten that we are one, already one. It is our mindset of separateness from the divine from oneself, from one another, and from the sacred earth. The fact is, we are made of God. All life bears the divine light. So to be created is to be related. We belong to one sacred community with a common source and a common destiny in God, the one at the heart of all life. So any violation of any human person or any part of creation is a violation of this oneness and sacredness. We are in the midst of a pandemic and violence against women have hiked during this time. Julian's words call us to love and whole making. All shall be well, all shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. Because she says, there is a force of love moving through the universe that holds us fast and will never let us go. Julian said these words to her suffering people during the Black Plague in her time, which lasted for decades. So we invite you to a simple meditation, a quiet reflection on for the love of whole making. So enter into the heart of love and love's healing presence.
So I invite you now to just take a couple of moments to notice what is stirring in your heart. What is moving for you, stretching you? What would it mean for you if you loved consciously, if love was the passion out of which you lived and served? At the heart of Jesus' ministry lay the desire and action that all may be one, that all may be whole. Jesus was a whole maker through and through, especially where it was most hurting. So his dream, his deepest desire is that we are all one. Jesus said to us over and over again, be healed, you are whole, you are free. Nano was and in us continues to enflesh the word of God within the heart. Her every desire, her every deed was that all be one. Love one another, sisters, as you have hitherto done. There is no greater joy than to be in union. To universal misery, Nano proposed ministry to persons, to ignorance, knowledge, to disillusionment, tendency of purpose, and to multiple vexations, singleness of heart. Faced with failure, she held fast to hope. Faced with death, she believed in a living future. And the program for that future she gave, in one word, love. So once again, just take a few moments of quiet to ask yourself, how does that same love energy, how might that same love energy, whole making energy become real in your life?
And Jesus said to them, woman, women, you are set free. Love's healing presence. Amen. A sincere thanks to the three members of the Spirituality and Charism Committee for sharing these important elements with us. Uh, they are engaging process uh, provided us um, with with the strength that uh, our soul and heart needs to, to keep advocating for the elimination of violence against women and children. Um, before handing over the microphone to Anne-Marie to conclude the webinar, um, Meriti, do you think that that's uh, now the, the, the now is the time to take the screenshots i think so i think the people in the united states are awake and hopefully the people in australia and new zealand aren't sleeping so we'll try everyone wake up uh you know get some color on your face and we're going to take some photos um so just keep smiling or turn off your video now if you don't want to be a photo taken so um all right smile big everyone <laughs> Two more. All right, I think Anne Marie, I think you are up. Is that correct, Despina? Yes, uh, yes. I'm now handing over the microphone to Anne Marie, the IEPA Executive Director, to conclude the webinar. Uh, on my part, thank you for your time and uh, for your patience, and hope to see you all again soon. Anne Marie, you have the floor. Thank you to both. Uh, thank you both, uh, Mary T and Despina. Uh, so uh, we have come to the end of our webinar uh, during the last uh, 90 minutes or 95 minutes. I hope we have delivered on the purpose of our webinar. I, I myself think we have. But before I close, I want to say a few words of, of gratitude. Firstly, on my own behalf and on behalf of the other members of the team, a sincere word of appreciation to each of you for who participated in today's webinar. It was very encouraging for us as a team to be able to share this time with you. And uh, in my in the breakout group I was in, uh, it was uh, so um, encouraging to that it, that somebody said that the, the specific advocacy focus elimination of violence against women and children is common to us all. In the group, we were there from Australia, Africa, the United States, England, and Ireland. A special word of thanks and sincere thanks to Meredith. Meredith, your presence and your sharing brought reality into our IPA webinar. We are grateful for your courage and wish you every blessing as you continue to advocate in, as you said, comfortable conversations. My thanks to my team members, my companions, to Spina, to Spina, a, you, whom I all will agree did a great job, both not alone in her presentation, but in the mentoring of this, uh, of this uh, webinar. She is also doing a great job at the UN uh, as our IPA NGO representative. This year is the 75th anniversary of the UN and the Spina last month initiated a webinar titled Faith Speaks to UN 75. Many of you here today were also present at that event, online event. At that event, Spina brought great leadership and uh, we uh, were proud of her and uh, hope to continue to support her in her work on our behalf. A sincere word, a special thanks to Mary T, our program action leader, who did an amazing job today uh, and getting his in and breakout sessions but also in all the visuals. Uh, thank you, Mary T, for all the other tasks you took, undertook so willingly. Mary T is responsible for the IPA Justice Context update, monthly update, which is a very informative communication which she sends to Justice Context, and they in, in turn contribute to their, um, within their um, networks. And we are very grateful for, to Mary T for this. Editions of this update are up on the IPA website if people are interested. Lastly, or coming near the end of my companions, are the Trinity, the Trinity of the Spirituality and Charism group. 
Uh, today they brought spirituality and justice together by guiding us through a process to embrace the issue of violence against women and children. A call from the Seventh Assembly was that spirituality in the charism strand of IPA's new structure would ensure that the work of IPA continues to be brought into dialogue with Christian theological perspectives in the context of presentation of spirituality and charism in a continually evolving universe. And COVID-19 pandemic is indeed part of our evolving universe. My thanks again to our justice contacts who led the breakout sessions and, who, and for your ongoing work uh, with IPA. We have had a wonderful year working together. A word of thanks also to a number of IPA trustees and, and directors who are, have been on participating in this webinar to thank you. I mentioned in my introduction that IPA celebrates 20 years of ECOSOC status. I think it, this is the moment to acknowledge those who worked on the process of obtaining it. The IPA coordinator at the time was Sister Maria Lopez, who was in the New Winter congregation. She was supported by a team of three, two of whom is unbelievable, are here. Uh, one is uh, uh, the IPA uh, spirituality team, and the other is one of our justice contacts, who are Terry Abraham and Anna Lane. So we'll, we'll be, I give a, a hand up to them. The third person on that team was Yvonne Nelson, rest in peace. I'd like to express our gratitude to the four networkers who have been part of a IPA over the years. One of them whom I've seen here on the webinar, Elena Hoy. Uh, Elena gave me great help as I began my, my position. And there were three NGOs previous to Despina, and one of them is here today, uh, Elsa. And Elsa, we're delighted you're with us. Indeed, I acknowledge all those who have been part of the story of IPA over the years. We are now standing on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, as we together embrace our evolving chapter in the IPA story. So I bring this webinar to a close with the words of the Seventh Assembly Prayer. Creator God, you are luring us into a future more expansive than our minds can conceive. Unsettle us, disturb us, move us to the end edge new horizons. Amen. And thank you all until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank very you very much. Thanks, everyone.